Good day and welcome to yet another one of our Rancos Weekly Wraps. As usual, what we'll do is we'll go over the stuff that happened this week and how it'll affect you and your investments going forward. Uh, three topics for this week are as follows. We will discuss uh, retail sales from South Africa. We had a couple you know, companies come out with retail sales figures recently and it's interesting to look at what's happening in the South African market. We'll also discuss um, the FOMC meeting. Uh, you know, the U.S. had a shortened week this week, but on Wednesday they came out with uh, minutes from the last meeting and uh, the market obviously reacted to that. And finally, we will do a deep dive into the entertainment streaming sector. Uh, I think it's an interesting topic to discuss and, you know, I have a take on it that maybe you might not have uh, thought of before. Okay, let's start off with uh, retail. The seven retail sales figures have come out uh, for a couple of companies recently. We saw, for instance, uh, Mr. Price come out with numbers, Lewis come out with numbers. The general trend for Mr. Price was basically they said that uh, they were really badly affected by load shedding. A number of you know stores were basically shut down during those periods. Uh, and of course, that made an impact in terms of you know traffic going through and sales being done. I think in total they lost you know like tens of thousands of hours of, of total you know uh, sale time across all these stores in South Africa, which is obviously quite an impactful event. They also mentioned the fact that um, some disruptions happening with the social grant payments uh, were basically responsible also for uh, a lack of demand. That was quite an interesting uh, factor. I had not known that there had been such a uh, significant disruption coming through from social grants. So uh, that is obviously a factor that uh, Mr. Price felt. And Mr. Price, as you know, is you know reasonably good quality, but you know more on the lower end of the market. Other news from Lewis. Uh, Lewis also said that they didn't find retail sales totally were falling that much. They didn't find their revenue coming down that much, but they didn't find a discrepancy. What they saw was credit sales really strong, cash sales really under pressure. Uh, it would appear that people in South Africa are still buying stuff, but they're buying it more on credit right now. Quite a difficult thing to be doing because you know interest rates are rising. Uh, so you know, and how long that lasts, I don't think it's a it's a, something that lasts indefinitely until we see a turnaround in the African economy. I'm just quite nervous about the African retail sector as a whole. Uh, next bit of news: the FMC minutes uh, came out on Wednesday. The market loved it because basically it said that they were going to be a little less aggressive than had been, uh, you know, announced previously. Now, look, we had to expect that. We saw already a significant run up in November because we had inflation numbers lower than expected. The only way those inflation numbers were going to affect the market was because the FOMC was going to react less hawkishly because it didn't have to because inflation was down. So the market should have had some kind of anticipation that there was going to be this kind of, you know, retraction of some of the more aggressive stances of the FOMC. That's the uh, the Monetary Committee of the Federal Reserve. That's the, uh, the the people that decide what rates are decided for the U.S. Fed. You know, just to uh, clarify that, the fact that they came out and were a little less aggressive to be expected. Inflation at the moment is seeming to be you know, splitting up in the world, um, in Europe and elsewhere in the world, including South Africa, by the way. Inflation is still rising. Uh, in the U.S., it seems to have peaked quite significantly. We are seeing, you know, the last inflation figure that one that caused all these uh, recoveries to happen right now. I think we had two-month, uh, you know, global highs for stock markets. Uh, that all came in after we had this inflation number in the U.S. that showed that inflation had fallen more than had been anticipated. However, in the U.K., inflation is higher than anticipated and eating new highs. In South Africa higher than anticipated and higher than the last period. So not everywhere in the world has experienced this. Uh, the real recovery through with regards to uh, inflation you know, pulling back. That being said, because the Fed's importance as a global reserve currency, if they don't raise interest rates as much as had been anticipated, it'll give some breathing room to other countries. Even though those countries should be raising interest rates because their inflation numbers are still high, the fact that the Fed is pulling back will allow them to have some breathing room. Um, the round strengthened uh, just after the news, basically to below 17 for a little while. Uh, how long this lasts, let us see, but right now a bit of positivity coming through. And look, I do expect the U.S. inflation number to probably come down for a while more. The reason being is that a number of factors like housing, like um, medical inflation, those factors we kind of have a strong trend there already towards lower than uh, expected numbers coming through. That is going to basically feed into inflation figures for the next little while, and that should be an overall headwind into high inflation numbers. So inflation should be low in the U.S. However, in Europe, I don't think that's the case. I think we're going to have a very bad winter. I think energy prices are going to be terrible. And I think we're going to see 
inflation in Europe, uh, you know, really getting higher. Uh, like I mentioned a while back, we could be seeing as much as 15% inflation in the UK by you know, the early next year. So that's obviously a thing to worry about. And now finally comes to our deep dive. So this week we're going to discuss uh, something a little unusual, which is the streaming services, you know, uh, Netflix, Disney Plus, uh, you know, uh, Amazon Prime and so on. And I'm going to give you my thesis about the sector and what I think, you know, is going to be the winners and losers there. Now here's my, my general belief. Not all these companies are operating on a level playing field. What do I mean by that? When it comes to like entertainment, streaming entertainment, some companies like Netflix are just operating as you know streaming entertainers. They get their uh, you know product, they build it up, and they sell it to the market, and basically get paid by subscribers for it. Some companies make a bit of money off the IP, but more than that. For instance, Disney. You know, you know what it is. You do a, a Disney movie. You basically do you know Frozen, and then suddenly you don't just make money off Frozen, which is a very profitable movie in its own right. You make money off Frozen, you know, uh, theme parks. You make money off Frozen merchandise, of Frozen games, Frozen IP that you will be milking not just for the next year or two, but for the next you know, half a century, maybe century or more. That's how Disney works. Think about it. Mickey Mouse, it's like a hundred years old. Goofy. Donald Duck, these are all you know, creations that are more than 50 years old. You know, uh, Winnie the Pooh, these are, these are all things that Disney is collecting money from from a long time. Star Wars, you know, it's from the 1970s. Uh, you know, Marvel is going to be something that they're going to be making money on almost indefinitely. So when Disney creates something uh, like, a, like a piece of entertainment, it makes money from the entertainment, from the streaming service, the Disney Plus service that you, they, because consumers pay for, but then it makes money from the theme parks and from all the other things. Now, imagine you have two sources of income versus one source of income, like you know Netflix. Who's able to spend more money and make better products? Obviously, the one with more money. Okay, it's Disney going to have Disney going to have an, an advantage when it comes to uh, the services going forward. And I think, and then comes the big guy in the block that is um, Amazon. Now, Amazon basically is really, really uh, operating with a very unfair advantage. Their advantage is that they don't really care about the, the entertainment. All they want you to do is get Amazon Prime, because once you have Amazon Prime, you get the Amazon free delivery and all the other stuff that comes along with it. And once you have Amazon Prime and have all these extra features, you start spending a hell of a lot more money on Amazon than you did in the past. <clears throat> We're talking thousands of dollars more a year on Amazon than you did in the past. So from Amazon's point of view, the whole entertainment sector could be, you know, a loss maker. Why? Because they make so much money from the uh, people just joining Prime and you know, b being part of the Prime ecosystem that they could just have streaming as a loss leader going out into that uh, sector. So now you have three companies, one that makes money just from uh, streaming, one that has separate sources, and one that doesn't even care about the money it, spend, it, it uh, makes from streaming because it makes money from elsewhere. Now, streaming is just another you know, promotional service it has out there to drive numbers towards its real business, which is, of course, um, you know, the retail. So in that environment, where do you think Netflix is going to be? I don't think it's going to be very strong. Now, there's ways Netflix can get around this, and I'll discuss that in a second or two. But understand that just from a pure business model point of view, Netflix has got a real disadvantage versus Disney and an even greater disadvantage, I think, versus Amazon Prime. And there's obviously the, the big boy in the room, the biggest uh, you know, uh, thing out there, and that is actually YouTube. People forget about that. Now, YouTube Premium alone is, is significant. You know, I think it's like 50 million uh, subscribers. But if you look at it, Forget about the premium, but YouTube makes from advertising alone is equivalent to what Netflix makes in total revenue. So the YouTube advertising revenue, just the stuff it gets from the ads, basically uh, is more than what uh, Netflix makes in total. And the advantage YouTube has is not so much of YouTube, it's about Google. Why? Because Google has this massively you know, well-developed, strong advertising link. YouTube has the ability to tap into Google's you know, advertising services because they're both part of the same company. And that advertising link gives YouTube a massive advantage over any other streaming free, uh, free streaming service out there, or almost quite frankly, any other social media service out there, quite frankly. Because yes, Facebook has the opportunity to do certain things, Twitter can do certain things, but none of them have that link that YouTube has with Google that gives them that advertising linkage, allowing them to basically you know, really sell their ads in the most targeted way and get more revenue. If you look at any kind of uh, social media style, there, be it on Instagram, be it on Facebook, be it on Twitter or on TikTok even, you know, TikTok obviously the, the rising star out there. 
If you look at any of those guys there, what you're going to find is that most of those content creators want to get a YouTube channel because that is where you make money. Yes, you do a lot of stuff on, on, um, on TikTok. You make a bit of bucks. I mean, let's, let's say those guys are poor. But the biggest guys on TikTok are making a fraction of what the medium guys on YouTube are making. The biggest people on like Facebook not doing that well except for when they have another business out there that they can feed people from Facebook into that business. But in terms of just posting and getting like, you know, you know f payback for, you know, posting content and so on, not really as strong. Twitter, you know, it's virtually non-existent. I mean, Twitter's, uh, you know, ad revenue is almost nothing compared to what like Facebook and Google are getting. You know, it's, you know, it's billions of dollars, but not, it's almost nothing. Uh, so the advantage that YouTube has, Google, the advantage that Prime has, it doesn't even care about the profitability of its entertainment sector. Disney has the advantage that it's basically is better able to um, monetize IP than anybody in the world. You know, you, you make a film, you know, imagine Netflix was around 100 years ago and made a film. It would not be making money off that film today. Disney is still making money off Mickey Mouse and Money Mouse and Donald Duck and Goofy and all those guys. It's still making money off The Little Mermaid and The Lion King and everything else that comes along with that. And then finally you have Netflix operating in a straightforward, we sell you basically a subscriber service and you pay us, uh, and we provide you with the entertainment because of that. Like I said, I don't see how this model survives. Netflix has come out with an advertising possibility for a cheaper cost, it talks about raising you know, the, the, their, um, their prices. I really don't see, you know, that's going to be sufficient. Now, the one advantage I did mention that Netflix has, you can take advantage of, is that because it sells purely entertainment, it doesn't have to worry about some of the other factors out there. So it can be a bit more risque, a bit more cutting edge and so on. But Disney can't really do things that are too crazy. Why? It's Disney. If Disney starts doing stuff that's more adult, more, you know, uh, risque, more uh, boundary pushing, it gets much pushback. Amazon really doesn't care about what it's, it's putting on in terms of entertainment, as long as you watch. So Amazon does have some pretty risque stuff out there like The Boys and, you know, um, uh, Invincible and so on. But generally, it, because they don't have that eye on the ball, they can also make massive mistakes like The Rings of Power. The Rings of Power, the most expensive TV show ever made, by all accounts, uh, you know, a failure. So they don't have that advantage of the focus. So Netflix still has a chance out there. Unfortunately, Netflix has to take advantage of that by basically providing the stuff that, you know, the other companies won't provide or the qualities the other companies won't provide. It probably won't beat Net uh, Disney with quality. I mean, you know, Avengers are, you know, highest quality probably in my entertainment out there. Uh, but it can beat them with doing subject matter that Disney won't want to do. It probably can beat uh, Amazon in terms of quality because Amazon, like I said, may have more money. Uh, but money doesn't always result in quality, as you can see from things like, for instance, like I said, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, the rings of power so that is the possibility that netflix has so that is the roundup about the uh, entertainment sector the streaming sector that i see at the moment if i had to bet you know if i could buy any of these things yeah, i'd probably look at the amazons and the you know alphabet slash googles of the world as opposed to even the disney's or the um the netflix's just because of the fact that it's they have so much inbuilt advantages on one side you have the revenue stream and all the other stuff that comes along with youtube and by the way youtube doesn't have to produce material youtube just makes people produce and if you're a success it pays you you I know mean, sony has to buy stuff and then hope it's a success uh, you know it's called uh, uh sorry uh facebook so uh, sony uh, amazon and uh, netflix and uh, you know disney they will create stuff and hope it's a success youtube gets the stuff and if it's success they pay if it's not success they don't pay okay amazon basically doesn't really care so as long as people buy uh, prime and once they own the prime system you know that's going to be just an add-on that they're willing to give out for free and those that's why i'm picking them disney has advantages you know it has that you know massive inbuilt you know love for people and so on but as you can see what happened recently with the replacement of uh, chapek by uh, Iger. There's a lot of political insider stuff happening right there. And just a little coverage of what happened in that particular thing. Uh, Bob Chapek basically was replaced. Why? Because he was trying to be a little less woke than the company would allow. Uh, he wanted to effectively have different you know, entertainment streams for different parts of the world. Uh, the company didn't want to do that. The like, cast members, as he calls them, the staff, was, is a bit more liberal. And they didn't want to basically you know, exclude uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ themes from places like the Middle East or Asia or Africa and so on. Uh, Chapek said basically that he doesn't think that these places are ready for this kind of material and it would harm them in terms of sales. He's been kicked out. Uh, Bob Iger, his predecessor, is now his replacement as well. If they go through that whole, you know, 
pushing this, the, the, uh, an agenda like that to the rest of the world, you're going to find that they're going to have a lot of pressure. They'll be successful in the North, Northern America and they'll be successful in Western Europe. I don't think it's likely to be successful in the Middle East, uh, almost certainly not going to be successful in the Middle East, less likely to be successful also in Asia, Africa, and possibly even South America. That's not the world to be excluded from. So that's why I think that Disney has problems, even though it has probably, like I said, the best quality and the best ability to maximize its revenue off its, uh, its IP. Okay, that's it. Uh, thanks for joining me this week, and I look forward to seeing you guys again next week.